feedback. Yeah, I just turned on the recording. But yeah, so what Ian's asking about is, you know, he's implementing it for the first time this semester. He has feedback to give, which is great. Uh, I was saying that I'm about to do some traveling uh, this week, going to Nebraska for their astronomers meeting. And then when I come back, I have some overdue, way overdue NSF reports and other things to catch up on. But once that's done, I'm going to dedicate about a month to finally doing all these opus revisions. The other educators gave me a bunch of feedback a couple years ago now, where we spent uh, one one meeting, uh, you know, every week was dedicated to a different lab. And so I have the recordings and I'm going to go through those and, and write down all their feedback. I have probably 30 or 40 emails that have accumulated in my inbox over the years. and I've never filed them. They sit in my inbox. And um, so if you if you're implementing this semester and you have immediate feedback, send an email. That's great. And if you want to have a, a discussion meeting, we can do that either separately or even as part of this, we could take a week uh, during the training to uh, deliver feedback and discuss things. But I guess what I'll do is once I start doing lab revisions, I'll let you all know as well as I'll say, okay, this week I'm doing lab one revisions. If you offer lab one and have feedback, get it to me. Uh, Cause this can be, you know, I do revisions every half decade or longer uh, between five and 10 years. And so this is going to be, the real opportunity to get uh, changes made. I, I may do little tweaks, but to have serious changes made, this is your chance. It's your decadal survey. <laughs> yes, decadal <laughs> survey, yeah. And, and as part of um, the funding from NSF, uh, we were supposed to have feedback meetings every year. Uh, we're not doing that until I implement the round of feedback I've already gotten. But um, at some point before the end of the grant, we'll have another feedback session, and you're all welcome to participate in that and some of the funding. You know, with the NSF grant, there's $3,500 worth of funding. I think the way it goes is 500 is for this, 500 is for meeting again in some future semester where you can give me feedback, particularly after you've implemented it a time or two and you have uh, things to say. And um, and then 500 um, every year for doing it and doing the surveys. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm recording. Just want to check. Yep, I'm recording. And um, I woke up this morning. Just I'm so tired. And so I didn't do any prep. Instead, uh, I decided to take an alternative approach to preparing. And I got my uh, uh, breakfast of chimichurri here. And uh, I decided to go with the sugar, sugar high approach. Uh, hopefully within a few minutes, that sugar high will kick in and carry me through. But um, it may be a little rough until that happens. So let's, uh, I'll um, share my screen. And does anyone have any questions or comments while I'm getting set up? I do, Dan. <laughs> okay, good. Let's do it. Um, I just have a, it's sort of a general question um, about maybe optimal ways of building the course around um, Opus Labs uh, for the rest of the course. Um, maybe, uh, would it be possible maybe to share what you folks do with your syllabi to coordinate with the Opus Labs that we're doing to see how you kind of thread it all together? Yeah, um, I can do that, though. So there are all sorts of different ways you can implement Opus. Some people um, do it in the classroom. Some people have standalone labs that match up with the classroom material temporarily. Some have standalone labs that don't. And at UNC, that's what we have. We have standalone labs. It's kind of its own course. Um, in fact, we've done a restructuring that any of our 100 level courses including like Alien Life in the Universe, which is a new, very popular course, et cetera, et cetera. They can all use this as their lab requirement. So this, we run it kind of as a standalone one credit course, even though it's like two credits worth of work, but that's how most labs are. So me sharing how we integrate is not going to help you. But um, among all the other educators, some do make a serious effort of integrating it. Um, Maybe uh, you send me an email 
and I'll come up with some names. So how, how are you doing it? Are you integrating into the course or are you just, it's a separate meeting time, but it's meant to match up with the course material. I, um, I uh, allow students to work on the lab projects as part of each class or most of the classes when we meet. Yeah. And uh, and then we also are doing other material every class as well. So I'm kind of integrating it into the regular astronomy class, but it's influencing how I teach the class. For instance, now this is only my second time through or second mm -hmm. time ever teaching astronomy. But uh, so this time I'm doing a lot of planetary stuff to start off to kind of match the first couple opus labs. And then as we go further and further out on the distance ladder, I'm intending to do like stellar evolution and then galaxies and things like that to try to keep it a little bit all together. Yeah. Uh, so kudos to you. You're doing what I think needs to be done. I and So I'm, I'm starting to um, develop strong philosophy slash rants on, on, I think, the future of astronomy education. And I, I think we're doing Start, starting. Yeah, <laughs> start, yeah. Uh, over the past decade, I've been developing these ideas. And if you come, we're holding, I think I mentioned we're holding this meeting in Chapel Hill in May of next year. And other people have been developing this kind of same philosophy that we're doing everything backwards. And so we've decided to hold a meeting. And I hope many of you can come and participate in that. Um, you know, the, the standard approach is you have the the lecture section and you're trying to cover everything in the textbook. And then you have these extra labs. And historically, the labs have not connected very well with what you're teaching in class. You know, they're going out using small telescopes. Oh, I see the moons of Jupiter. Oh, this star is red. This star is blue. Or maybe planetarium experiences where they're measuring angles on the dome, but they change their seat. They just had a hundred percent error because the dome's not at infinity. Or they're raising the light level, and you're counting stars for a lesson on light pollution, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. None of these things connect with what we're teaching in class, which are the greatest discoveries of the past four hundred years. And these labs that we're trying to produce and experiences, both with Opus and with MWU, which is kind of orthogonal, I can talk about that. Uh, is to really connect to the things we teach in class. And I'm, I'm coming to the opinion that we need to flip these things around. Because uh, astronomy, they, um, they forget most of what we teach them, right, in, in the lecture scenario. We teach, and particularly, and I think I've had this rant earlier with you all, maybe at the beginning, but elementary school, middle school, high school, we teach seasons and phases, seasons and phases. Even though none of that really scaffolds to stars and galaxies. It's just the thing that we teach first is undergrad. So that's what's taught in all the K through 12 curriculum. It's, we obsess over seasons and phases when it's kind of not really the key thing in astronomy. Anyway, that, that's a side rant. But um, so we focus on teaching material, which they forget, like seasons and phases. And see, you've seen the Harvard video, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's... it's no one's fault. It's, they simply don't need this information to have happy, successful lives. Uh, we are providing essentially, they signed up for a semester of edutainment. It's like turning on a PBS special. Oh, this is interesting and fun, but then I can forget it. And so I, I think we're doing the wrong thing. And it's going to take a sea change. I think what we should be doing is having three credits of mostly laboratory or investigatory experiences of the kind that teach the things that we're teaching in lecture, but we won't be teaching, we, we will no longer be able to teach everything from the front of the book to the back of the book. We'll select these experiences, and then you have to design some lecture around these experiences. I think we need to flip it around, and that way the students leave with, you know, for many of them, it's the last science course they'll ever take. And for some of them, if it's good, we convince them to take more and maybe become scientists. And instead of leaving with the idea of what is STEM, oh, STEM is a bunch of facts that I've forgotten because I don't need. That's essentially the conclusion that, you know, they we teach them all this stuff, they memorize it for the final, then they forget half the next day, and then it's an ex exponential decline after that. And they're back to thinking that the seasons are proximity and, and everything else. Um, 
uh, what's the point? And, the, and what's the lesson? The lesson is what STEM? Oh, I had a STEM course. My last STEM course, I learned that STEM is a bunch of facts that were told to me and I've forgotten them and because I don't need them. Uh, so instead, let's have them do STEM. And maybe they can really understand what STEM is by doing it. Uh, they can't really understand what STEM is, the, the fighting, the inquiry, like, oh, this didn't work. Why didn't that work? You know, the struggle. Uh, they won't understand it by sitting in a class and hearing the great results of the past 400 years. They're only going to understand it by doing. And then when they leave, they like, even if they forget the details of what they did, they leave with an appreciation of what science really is. And boy, that could improve our uh, voter population if we could create that instead of obsessing about why can't they remember the seasons are due to proximity. And I'll finish my rant real quick, but I, the fact that they go with proximity, it, kudos to them, really, because it's a technicality that our, orth, our our orbit is almost circular. So if they forget that little technical fact and they're just thinking through it, that's not a bad guess. Mercury's hotter than Pluto. Proximity is the primary thing that determines temperature. They're just forgetting a technicality about the shape of our orbit. So you can't really be down on them or down on us. So damn it, you set me off. It's the sugar. The sugar is kicking in. You set me off and I had my rant there. But anyway, it sounds like what you're doing, you're building your course around the doing and supplementing it with the listening, which can have an active learning component. But I think that's the that's where we need to move in the future. Um, anyway, it's different for other STEM disciplines, like introductory chemistry, you need that for the next chemistry course. Uh, introductory physics, you need that for the next physics course. And astronomy, most of them, it's the last thing they're ever gonna take. It's the last exposure to STEM. And we touch on all these other STEM disciplines. As part of Astro 101, they learn physics and chemistry and biology and geology and engineering and computer science and data science. And everyone loves astronomy. So it's a gateway and it's a drug. So we have a gateway drug and we're the dealers. And so what do we want to do with this power? And, and that's that's the thing we need to consider. And it, it's, it's gonna be challenging to convince people to flip things around, but that's part of what this meeting's for. We're hoping to produce an, um, a decadal plan that we will be pushing with funding agencies saying, we're doing this all backwards. It's time to change. The tools now exist where we can do this right, where they didn't exist 10 years ago. Stop, stop my rant. <laughs> anyway, so today we're going to talk about grading. So after that, it just seems like a letdown. It's like, how do we grade in web? So we're going to start by talking about uh, how do we grade in WebAssign? Because um, uh, you, you're probably getting labs back at this point. And then we'll start setting up lab four. That's the plan for today. But any other questions? No one wants to set me off again. So. Dan, I, I actually do have just one quick question and maybe you're gonna get to this, um, but through WebAssign, is there a way to extend the deadline for an individual student rather than the entire section? Yes. Yep, I'll show you that right now. So let's see, I'm Thanks. sharing. Actually, I also just figured that out and it took me a while. So Britt, I could show you later if if nobody else here. It's really or, easy. Yeah, if you got it there. So let's see, um, I'm in a previous year now for a class that's already closed. So I don't know if this is gonna work. It just, um, uh, I'm gonna show grading and I decided just to use the same student that I used in last year. Uh, Cause I just watched last year's video and I'll make it easier, but let's see if it works. What you normally do is you go to scores, And since this is a closed section, um, I'll open it here. And uh, here it is, grant extensions. So for any individual student you want to grant an extension to, you click on them. You can click on multiple if you want. You go to grant extension here and you can change it. You gotta get the format just right or you can use the calendar tool to fill it in and you save it and it will send you back to that page. And then once you've done that, I don't know if any of these students got extensions. Yeah, they did. Um, it's marked. 
I think it's marked with an asterisk. This asterisk may mean they got an extension or it may mean that the grade was changed manually, but it's marked somehow that they got an extension. Great, thank you. Thank you. I guess I would have found that if I had started grading yet. So I appreciate that, thanks. That's okay. Um, okay, so uh, let's pop back out here. Grading, how it works, what tools we provide for you. So let me slide up that notes from previous year here. Okay, so um, let me slide this over and talk about that after grading. Hmm. Okay, so one of the nice things about this, you know, Chapel Hill, we have hundreds of students taking this, so we designed it to be maximally auto-graded uh, to just make our lives. If you have hundreds of students, then uh, it doesn't matter how many students you have. Grading sucks in general. It takes time. Uh, so anything that can be auto-graded is. But some things can't be auto-graded, like if they're submitting an image and you're looking for things in that image, or if they're giving a short answer, though probably in a couple of years, AI will be able to grade those for us. Um, and it already can if you know you, you go through the effort with ChatGPT, but still, right now that's manual here. Uh, graphs. Uh, and in lab one, there's a little bit of extra auto grading because we never know what targets are available. Uh, right, we have these tables of all the planets and uh, stuff in the table will be graded. It just won't be tabulated because for every every time you run it, uh, some are not observable, some are observable. So of the labs, lab one is the one that takes the most manual grading, uh, the things that the auto grader doesn't do. Lab two is probably the next amount because you have a lot of graphs uh, those graphs where they're showing how length of day changes with season and latitude and sun elevation angle changes with season and latitude, and they're just complicated. And just going through the student short answers can just wear your mind down to a nub. But um, after that, each lab gets easier and easier. Uh, there's more and more of it that can be auto graded. So keep that in mind uh, that it will only get better after grading lab one. Lab one's not that terrible. Okay, so let's go into, let's see, uh, to grade. Here I'm in instructor view. Again, this is a previous semester because I'm familiar with this one student's lab because I used it last year. Uh, you go into scores. And since this is a retired course, I have to bring the students back up by hitting all. This is a good thing. Like if you're coming back next semester, maybe you had a student who had an incomplete um, or your class has reached its close date uh, that we set it up with, but you're still doing your grades and you come and all your students are gone. It's because it's after the due date. All you have to do is press that all button and they reappear. But I've had many instru instructors panic saying, oh my God, all my students are gone. All the grades are gone. It's there. Okay. And so here are the students and this sec section was graded a year ago. So to grade, you go up here to grade answers. And it has a list of questions. And, and we think of the questions as all the individual boxes. So there's like 50 or 60 things for them to answer. But in web assigned terminology, the whole lab is usually a single question and it has lots of subparts to it. Now for lab one and lab eight, they are too long to fit into a single web assigned question. So they break it into two parts. With lab one, it's real natural. It's week one and week two. And you may recall in week one, there is nothing to actually submit. So if you want, instead of grade all, you can here come here and just click on the second question. And that'll make it easier as you're going from student to student. You won't have to keep scrolling past all this text with nothing in it to grade. It uh, just makes it a little faster, a little more efficient. Then you start grading. And it'll bring up the first student, which is the student we're going to do, John Albright here. And it, it brings up the sections. And I've noticed a little bug. I don't know if it's with my browser, but if I open and collapse sections, they disappear sometimes in the grading mode. Scroll little mouse is dying as well. Um, and so if that happens, I just refresh my screen. Um, maybe it's just my browser, I don't know. But, um, okay. 
So, and, and then, you know, you can go to any student here, or you can go through in order uh, by clicking on next or previous, et cetera. Okay. So in part two, week two of the lab, every section has something in it to grade. And we've created a grading guide that, that goes through everything you need for the manually graded components. And let me just put this in the chat in case I haven't sent it around, which I'm looking for. Oh, here it is, chat. Okay. You don't have to use this guide. This is just what I give to my TAs. You don't have to grade as I grade. Um, you don't have to do all the parts of the lab. It's intended to be, uh, you have the freedom to be as flexible as you want. You don't have to do every lab. You don't have to do every part of every lab. And you don't have to grade as I grade. Dan? Uh, yeah. When I was starting to grade lab one, some of my students had difficulty putting in the telescope that was used for the observation. Mm -hmm. I wonder if anyone else had that difficulty. I've never heard that before. Um, usually in... Afterglow, so in Afterglow, you go to the information spot. That's where you get the date and time. The telescope should be listed there. If it's blank, or are you saying the problem was when they tried to type it in, it wouldn't accept it? Type it into WebAssign, which mm -hmm. telescope was used. It didn't accept the telescope, some of them told me. Maybe when they did the last update. So let me take a look down here. I found that they had to um, remove like the dash, like the prompt MO has a dash in the name. Uh, yeah, yeah it's they a, had to remove numbers. It's so they a were and pasting and they had to, they had to fix them a little. Uh, okay. That's great. If I'd love it if someone would just fire that off to me in an email. So as I said, I'm about to do a bunch of revisions. I can put a little note here at the top of the table or maybe here in the telescope column, uh, do not use special characters. Yeah, because look, looking at this here, there, there are no dashes. And the official name that they're copying out of um, Afterglow has the dash. So I, I never knew about this, but that's probably what it is. So, Dan, on that same um, topic, mm -hmm. can I ask a quick question? Yeah. So they tried to type in um, things like NA for not applicable if there was a planet that they couldn't observe, which they didn't need to do, but they thought they did. And so when they submitted it came back with an error message but then they tried to delete it and submit again and it kept coming up so how do you delete something that you have put in and make it stay gone so if it you ever had that problem no i haven't had that problem um i don't want to try to troubleshoot in real time but okay that and i thought maybe it was an easy answer and i will troubleshoot as well i haven't heard of either of these uh, normally, if you were to empty it out and submit, um, let's see, the... I mean, they tried delete and they tried backspace and they tried one other, we, we tried so that it visually was gone, but when they submitted, it popped back in. It wouldn't let them put oh. like NA for uh, the, like, uh, the dates, for example, because the format's different. Or for the planets, because not all of them were visible. So they'd already filled in the tail, the table saying no for Mars. But then when they yeah. got to the big table where they're supposed to put in information about their. Um... Here? Yes. Okay. And... Yeah, either there or actually the one that asked um... them for the, um, the ID number of the observation one of them that was a table like this and they put in na for all the ones they hadn't seen i'm looking at a lab from a year ago so it doesn't have those new tables for the id numbers yeah so uh if that's okay probably it, like here it's expecting a number mm -hmm. um, and so if they put in na that may be a problem and blank may also trigger a problem though that if they have this no response here it seems to go in uh yeah write it up and i'll do testing and i'll improve the instructions accordingly Thank you. Thanks. This stuff's always, it's amazing you can go all these years and then you keep finding new bugs in the system. Um, and this is, stuff like this must be stuff that people encounter all the time. It just never made it back to me. Anyway, uh, let's go to the grading guide. And uh, there's some instructions here 
and, and these are more for my students. You know, if we catch them cheating, this is my personal cheating policy. You don't have to worry about that. It tells you to load an exit viewer. I, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a tab here for every lab. And I'll go through everything in lab one today, but then you'll figure out the rest. It will all be very similar. And these are the items that require manual grading. Now I should say that if they submit anything, the auto grader will give them full credit. So they submit everything and then they check their score a second after the due date and they're like, oh, okay, I got a good score. And then like a week later, once you're done with manual grading, you actually brought their score down. And so that's something that a little bit of communication ahead of time is important because they're gonna be like, I had a blah, 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 and, and now it's 10 points lower, what happened? And it's just the process of manual grading takes longer. So let's see, the first thing here is section, procedure section B.1, images. And so that is, let's see, I had them down here. Dan, I, I got a quick question about that manual yeah. grading. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I've seen other uh, platforms that, um, like for example, in a test, if there's like a short answer or a fill in the blank, they will mark that as a zero until you go in and manually update that grade. That way their initial grade is actually worse, you know, and once you go in, the grade gets better. And I, and like, for some reason, students seem to be a lot more receptive to that. I agree. And, you know, seeing a good grade and then it drops. Like I use curves in my class and I always set the assignments such that the curve will be positive, and so they they, they become happy about the curves. If the curves brought them down, they'd be unhappy. Um, I have not seen a way to do that in WebAssign. Um, I I'll inquire next time I'm meeting with my rep. Um, but yeah, so uh, given the current situation, just a little bit of education uh, for for your students that okay. Um, the auto grading is done, and now we're going to go through do the manual grading. Your scores are going to go down, but they're going to go down for everyone, so don't worry. Okay, so the first thing here are images. Uh, they didn't get one of Venus, so no points are awarded there. Let's see, they got one of Mars, and you can grab and look at the screenshot. That looks acceptable. Um, the answer key is Mars at closest approach. It only looks this good for like a month or two every two years. Uh, the Mars image they will get will be a little bit smaller um, uh, and less detailed. Uh, let's look at another one here. It has more detail. Uh, this semester they got Jupiter. And so their Jupiter image looks decent here. Now, these things are marked for three points. And you, there's a way you can go in and change what the points are worth. Uh, and you could do that if you want. Most people just use the point structure that we've created. In the guide here, uh, it says, okay, this is three points. And it gives you some things you may want to subtract for. Like if they forgot to zoom in, right? It's, it said very explicitly in the lab, zoom in. You don't want a picture with a teeny tiny planet and you're squinting at it, trying to figure out if they did what they needed to do correctly. So if they forget to zoom in, we subtract a point. The brightness and contrast settings have to be set correctly. Um, where is it? Here. I'll bring it back up again. Like here they set the brightness and contrast so you can see the detail on the planet. They went with the default settings. It, this would just be a big giant glow. That's the, the atmospheric scattering. And, and so that they'd lose a point if they forgot to do that. What else is here? Uh, if it's streaked, they could have re-imaged and things of that nature. We say at the top, nothing should be negative. So if they make so many mistakes, don't go below zero. But that's, again, totally up to you. Also, some students will pull out extra targets from Twilight. You may have a planet um, that's right on the cusp, that it's maybe barely observable or maybe not barely observable. But someone got creative and they lowered the, uh, the air the uh, elevation from 20 to like 15 so they could get it or change the sun elevation angle, expanding the period of time you're willing to observe. Uh, you know, maybe instead of waiting for it to be minus 12, they said, okay, I'm gonna start at minus 10 and they were able to pull a planet out of the twilight sky. And if they do that, it's up to you how to deal with it. My attitude's good for them. I'm gonna give them bonus points for being so creative too pull out an edge case. 
And also there's a little note here to check for cheating. So let me show you that. That was requested by the, the educators. Let me bring their thing back up here. Because, you know, one student can do the work and just give it to somebody else. So what we did is we embed stuff in the EXIF data. These are all JPEGs. JPEGs can hold extra information called EXIF. And so there are all sorts of free EXIF viewers. I use EXIF Viewer Pro, and it's free. Um, right now, the button says remove because I have it installed. But if you go to if you Google EXIF Viewer Pro, you can install it, and it will add this little thing up at the top of your browser. What's it called? An extension, a little extension. And then uh, back, back here, you see, puts that faint little camera icon in the image. And uh, you'll start seeing this on like all of your web pages, but it's very small and not distracting. And you click on it and it opens up a tab with all the information about the picture. Like if you're on a news site, it'll give you information about the camera used and focal ratios and things like that. So we co-opted this got rid of most of it and it includes uh, the date uh, that it was taken uh, that's useful and uh, software is of course afterglow access but the key thing you're looking at is this it's who did the afterglow analysis comma who did the observation so john albright and that's who this is it has the username that they entered when they created their account remember when they created their account they could have skip this, in which case it would just say undefined or made up some other name. But this is their username. And hopefully between the two of those, it will resemble the name of the um, person at the top here at WebAssign, John, John Albright in this case. And then comma, and it pulls the observer's name out of the FITS header of the file. So we're not grabbing the database here. We're just you know, using the FITS header. Um, but when they took the image through Skynet, using their account, it stuck their name in the FITS header. So maybe you'll find someone else's name. Maybe someone else took the data, but this guy did the analysis or vice versa. And then you have a, a cheating incident on your hands. And uh, you all can deal with that as you see fit. But the instructors just want a quick way. They're like, how do I know this student did this? Well, now just one click and it's right there. So we found it very helpful. Let's see, what else do they have here? Here's Saturn. That one oh, looks we need to install the uh, add the add-on to be yeah. able to use that. The extension, okay. and it's real easy. You go to the, the page and you click the blue button and it's done. Or at least this this is for Chrome. I use Chrome. Um, but and, and there are any number of these that will work. Just the first one I tried was XFUR Pro, and it seems to work fine. Okay, and so you go through and uh, take away any points you need to for their images. Let's see, this one here is going to be Uranus, and that's what Uranus looks like, uh, kind of featureless. Uh, down here, they put in a fact about, no, no, I'm sorry. Here, they're doing a description of what they see. Uh, each description is worth three points. Here's the answer key. And since they didn't get all the targets, they're not going to get all the points. And this is something you really have to be upfront with them in lab one. It's impossible to get all 130 some points because not all targets will be observable. Uh, you can maybe, once you're done with this, say, okay, this is going to be out of 102 or whatever you think is appropriate that semester. WebAssign will always say the, the full 130 something. But someone may get 80 out of 136, I think it is. And maybe the most that semester you could get was 90. And so the students freaking out, thinking they failed, and, and in reality, they may have been the best score in the class. And it's really unique to this lab because uh, the plants, they're always moving around. The sun's moving around. There's just no way to predict, given when you start and when you stop this lab, what it will be. And, and so that's something, you, again, communication is important here. Okay, uh, let's see what's next in the list here. And... Um, Part B2, tables. Yeah, these tables. Keep clicking on the wrong thing. So this is where uh, they're measuring the angular size of their target. And we have all this information. Did you observe it and telescope and date and time? And, and then the measurement that they made. 
And after doing a couple of these, you'll know which targets were observable, which ones weren't. So the auto grader will put check marks if they put something in here. And I have very generous ranges for the angular size. I looked up as small as it ever gets and as big as it ever gets and expanded a little bit for atmospheric um, um, scattering. Uh, I'm, I'm not actually using the date they put in here to check this. If they're anywhere in the plausible range, they'll get a little check mark. And, but they're just, none, none of these are worth any points because I don't know which ones are observable or not. Suppose Ceres wasn't observable, but they went and entered something anyway. In fact, this person did. They entered a size for Ceres for, for an image they did not take, right? They got it wrong, but, um, you could actually go and create extra check marks if you're looking to cheat, I guess. Um, or maybe this was an honest mistake. So down here where it says, sign your name to attest the fact that you collected this yourself, they think it's an honor code. Really, I'm just creating a place where you can accumulate the points. And in the grading guide, I say give them half, you know, five points for filling in the supplemental information and five points um, for measuring the angular sizes. So there's, you know, in here it says, count up the number of check marks, divide by the number of check, mark, check marks there should be, multiply by five. And so here, only five were observable, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and they got all five of those. So in, they filled in their information here. I'd give them 10 out of 10, even though they tried to stick something in here. I, I'd just ignore that. Okay. And then there's another table down here where they look up the, we're no longer calling it true angular diameter, but the stellarium angular diameter and calculate a percent error. And you can see for the five targets, they looked it up and, and they got values that are acceptable. And then the percent error, uh, they did all of these calculations correct. Now, and so in this case, they'd get 10 out of 10 and, and, you know, you don't have to change anything. I should say with each of these, there's a comment region. So if they get something wrong and you're a diligent grader, you can write a comment in there as well. My TAs are good about that. When I'm doing grading, I, I usually skip over that just because I'm either busy or lazy or not as good as I should be. Anyway, there's another thing you can get is a calculator. So the two symbols are... The three symbols are check marks, X's, so correct, incorrect, and calculator. <clears throat> what calculator means is they did the calculation correct, it's just their inputs were wrong. So suppose they did a calculation and they had gotten this wrong, or they had gotten that wrong, but they did the calculation correct, given those incorrect inputs, they'll put up a calculator symbol. And Web assigned, to my great annoyance, assigned zero points for that. So in other labs where we have calculator possibilities, uh, we'll talk, you, know, you basically, if you want to get points for that, you just add it in the nearest spot that you can. But here, what I would do is, I'd since I think we've already penalized them for measuring something incorrectly, uh, let's not penalize them again for calculating it correctly given the incorrect measurement. So I just add up the number of check marks or calculators. Suppose two of these were calculators. I'd still say one, two, three, four, five, correct calculations and give them full credit. Make sense? Okay. Let's see what else is in here. Uh, table, table, uh, percent error and sources of error. Uh, so after this, we tell them to take the first one and present their percent error calculation. This is the first percent error calculation they're doing. So we want to see them do it. And in the grading guide, we show all sorts of acceptable things, measured minus true, absolute value divided by true, or maybe these parentheses, if measured is better, bigger than true, that's okay, or the other way around. We, you know, we're pretty generous there. Um, but common mistakes, sometimes they'll forget that second parenthesis and have an order of operations problem, or they forget to multiply by 100, or they'll report a negative percent error, which is a thing in some fields, just not in astronomy. So these are things you can subtract points for uh, here and comment on. And, you know, here's the correct equation. And then we have sources of error 
down here. And as we said when we went through this lab, it explicitly says, don't say human error, measurement error, calculation error. They're not valid. If you're, fi if you're finding such errors, go back and fix them. And if you can't figure out how to do that, talk to your instructor. So we give them fair warning here. The things we're looking for here, errors in that table, and it's down here in the key and in the grading guide, it gives suggestions. It says, if they say anything about atmospheric blurring, give them a point. If they can figure out the effect that um, big things have smaller percent errors and small things have bigger percent errors um, because of atmospheric blurring, if they can explain that, we give them a point. Like atmospheric blurring is like an arc second or two. And Jupiter is like 50 arc seconds across. So that's a small percent error. But Sirius is only half an arc second at best. And, and if you have one or two arc seconds of blurring, you're going to have an error of many hundreds of percent. And this will freak a lot of them out. How do I get this 400% wrong? And so that's why we ask them to see if they can reason through this. Not everyone gets that. And then the other point here is... Uh, measuring is difficult because you don't know where the edges are. It's a little blurry, a little pixelated, so they have to make an educated guess, pick a certain color of gray in the grayscale map to be their edge, and the students are pretty good about getting that one. So three points there, and those are the three. That's the way we distribute them. Again, you can be different about it. Now, moon identification, coming down here in the chart, um, Three points for the images. Again, we want them to zoom in. We want them to get the brightness and contrast so we can see the moons. Um, and what's the subtract point if moon's not detected? Oh, and so if they submit a picture where there are no moons, it's because they're looking through clouds or they had the wrong exposure time. And so they probably should have um, gone back and re-exposed. But let's look and see how John Albright did here. Let's see, got Jupiter, bring it up there. And they here they provide the universal date, universal time. So grading these, it's best if you have two screens. If you have two screens, you're good. So on my second screen, I bring up Stellarium. I actually have it already set the, to this particular example. And, you know, you have to do like the students do. You put in universal time and turn off daylight savings time. And I just turn off the ground and the atmosphere and I put in equatorial mode. So it's oriented the same way as their images. Once you do all those things, you can just leave it up on your other screen. And it's just a matter of um, picking a target and then having the date time window here open. and Let's see, it's month, day, year. You have to put in year, month, day, hour, minute, second. The seconds don't matter that much, but you can just type these in and say, yep, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, Callisto, Ganymede, Io, Europa, got them all right. Great. And then it becomes real easy. Uh, let's see, they also did Saturn. There it is. And so let's see here. We'll just go to Saturn and we'll adjust the time for what they had here. Uh, they got this one on the 11th, 23, 36. So Titan way off here on the left. And then close in, Dione, Rhea, and Solidus. And the rest are lost in the glow of Saturn. I imagine if they tweak the glow, tamp, as we described in the lab, you tamp the glow down, they probably could have gotten Tethys. And it looks like my TA uh, said, yep, yeah, you should have gotten Tethys as well. And so docked, docked a point. No, somehow the student got five points. Oh, yeah, these are worth six three for the image stuff and three for the identification stuff. So docked a point for missing techies. And you can grade these again at different levels of acceptance. Uh, we're pretty strict about it. And so this, this bold means you're gonna have to have Stellarium up 
if you want to check these carefully. And then um, we ask for one uh, point. Uh, we give them one point for a fact for clicking the wrong tab. For every moon they discovered on their own, we ask them to look up a fact. And so it's a point for each up to 12. Sliding down. This was the dwarf planet identification. So I have a scroll wheel mouse, but the scroll wheel is given out here. Uh, they're submitting two images. One is their Pluto image. There it is. This is worth three points for getting the right field, for marking reference stars and marking Pluto. And then they submit their DSS. Unfortunately, you can't bring them both up. You have to kind of blink between them. But looks like they did a good job. They marked the same reference stars in each. Pluto's marked, so I would give full credit. Um, submitted Haumea here. My graders uh, didn't give any points. I don't know why, though. It looks like a hot pixel, not Haumea, but anyway. Or maybe it wasn't observable that time of year and they just submitted somebody else's. I don't know. But, uh, and then a point about each that they detected. So this, these, I mean, a, uh, a fact about each. Again, this lab is not supposed to be scientifically deep. It's just kind of a fun introduction, introduction to the skill set. And lastly, down here, their um, deep sky objects, they're two points each, you know, forgetting the object, it's not streaked, and they adjusted the brightness and contrast so it looks good. This next one is 47 tuck, sure. Galaxy, and then their moonshot. Yeah, that looks great. And it appears my grader gave them all points for those things. I think that's the, the end? end, yeah. For the uh, opportunity for them to do the color mixing in this one, um, are the instructions here very much like the instructions for MWU or the as the MWU version much, much more elaborate? Uh, it, it starts out in the same place, but becomes more elaborate as you okay. go. So I think the instructions that we gave them here, it's just a simple red, green, blue combination. Um, we are... In the video, we showed them how to correct for dust along the line of sight. Uh, we give them like three levels in that video, and, and we say any of them is fine, where they can do simple color combination based on percents, or if they can calibrate it to background stars and correct for dust, that kind of thing. Uh, so very lenient here, and basically any color picture. And we, it's more about showing them how to do it so they can have fun. And that has not been added to the grading guide yet. Well. I don't think there are any points for it in lab one. It's just there in case you want to have fun doing it. Um, in MWU, we go many levels beyond that. We bring in luminance filters and narrow band filters and, and archival infrared and then radio. And, and, and so, yeah, it's a, there's a lot more to come. Okay, so that was grading. Any questions about that? Between my rant at the beginning and grading, um, we have 10 minutes left, so let's start lab four stuff. So uh, where are we? Oops, I didn't mean to click on that. There we go. So uh, we're, we completed lab three last, last time, and then we did the accessibility bit. And so this time we did grading. We're just going to set up lab four. And I think I think I have that down here already loaded up. Okay, lab four. So, uh, you know, here at the top, again, we have the basic introductory videos, introduction, background, procedure. Uh, we have the observing guide. Let's bring that up here. Actually, we probably won't start lab four. I'll show you how to put in the lab five observation. Um, yeah, the, yeah, the observing guide here is Consult your observing guide and, and submit whatever you need to. And at this point, you'll be submitting the observation for lab five. So I'll show you that in just a second. And then again, the reminder to um, check your sources of error 
from the previous lab. So you learn from the experience that you had. Again, many people do sources of error and they lose all their points because they did a poor job, but they never go back and check the answer key. So now we always have this reminder, go back and check your sources of error answer key and then the generic stuff. But before getting into lab four, I wanna show you how to submit lab five. Dan, can I ask a really quick question about that answer key? So do yeah. we open that to make that visible to them or is that automatically open after the due date? Uh, this, this key right here? The, the, oh, the key that you're suggesting students check. Yeah, it's automatically. So after the due date, they come back to their lab and then they will see what we're seeing here. Well, a version, this is the grading version, but uh, um, they will see basically, yeah, let me pop out and we'll take a look at exactly what they see. So here we are in, I don't know, we probably have to go to student view. But anyway, um, they come in, they go back to their lab and it, it may now be filed under past labs. It may not be on their list, but there'll be a little link for past labs. They go there and um, there's a button at the top saying, do you want to view the answer key? Because once they view the answer key, puts a little symbol here on the instructor side. So you know they look the, at the key. If they come asking for extra time and that key has been exposed, that means they already have all the answers. And they will see what we have been seeing in instructor mode. Uh, let me come out here. This is what they'll see. Uh, lab one, view. And I'm in answer key mode. And so as they're going through here, they will see this kind of thing with example images, example um, descriptions, that kind of thing. And they can, it happens automatically. Okay, but if a student has an extension, then that is not yet. That's right, they don't see right. it. Of course, they can just go talk to their friend. Who talk does to your friend, right, right. But yeah, okay. Thank you. That's why I only do that if they have a good excuse. All right, so uh, we're clearly not gonna get into lab four, but let, let's get into the submitting observations for lab five and I'll bring up the observing guide. Let's do it from there. And so this, you know, this is our observing guide. It has the calendar saying two weeks before lab five is due, uh, they should submit their observations. And let's go down here to the hints for lab five. This is another one where the instructor will place the observation. Lab four and lab five, the instructor places the observation. In lab four, it's because it's such a tricky observation. The parallax simultaneous observation requires that special priority level. In lab five, it's just because it's gonna burn a lot of credits. It's gonna burn about 4,000 credits and each student only has 1,800. And so the instructor should put this in for the class. It's a bulky observation. The class will share it. Again, I feel it. It's important to do this in front of the students so they feel part of the process, so they feel data ownership. This belongs to my class. Instead, this is just some archival data set I was pointed to. And, um, you know, here's a link to the video. Uh, you can also go to lab five in the section there, but here's the video telling you what to do. And basically, in lab four is parallax, lab five is standard candles. We're starting to work our way up the cosmic distance ladder. And in lab five, we're going to look at an R. Lyrae, a Cepheid, and a type 1a. Now, the Cepheid is archival because it's a 60 day period object. It's the only thing in nearby, you know, outside of the LMC. We're talking nearby galaxies. It's the only thing you can really see with small telescopes. It's the one Hubble used for that. Um, and uh, you know, beyond Andromeda as well. And uh, for the type 1a supernovae, they occur randomly. So both of those are archival, but the R. Lyrae, we try to have one thing in every lab that's observed. And so we want you to put in an observation for an R. Lyrae. And in the lab, we give recommendation, you know, we tell you which ones to do, different ones for each season. What else do we have here? Uh, some in front of the class. So it's a, it's a simple observation. It's just a repeating observation eats up a lot of credits. So you have to put it in. And 
uh, make sure you have enough credits in your account. Hopefully by now you've kind of sorted out the credit management. You go to your group and there's a thing called manage credits and you can go in there and you can give students more credits. You can give yourself more credits. If you have any students that dropped, you can pull the credits back into the general pool. Make sure you have enough credits to put this observation in. If you simply don't, email me and I can give you more credits as well. Uh, it says to select all available prompt telescopes, including our telescopes in both Chile and Australia. Uh, the Chile telescopes are coming back online now. Uh, and we have hooked up. And in fact, I'm, I think prompt five in Chile is on the system. Though there's a, a bug right now, the bandwidth is too low to do anything. Uh, so we're gonna, hopefully going to get this sorted out in the next day or two, but our Chile telescopes are coming back, which is good because our remaining Australian telescope just had uh, its camera has ice problems. And that, you know, we'll have that fixed in a, in a week or so, but because we have a spare camera in Perth. Anyway, uh, Chile's coming back. It's not quite there yet, but very soon. And um, once it's done, you'll again tell your students how to get to it. In Afterglow, they go to the group level, into your directory, and then into your observation. And again, I'm just kind of half joking. If your instructor utterly and embarrassingly fails, do not fear. There's archival data in the sample directory, which, you know, if the bandwidth doesn't improve at Saratololo, uh within the next day or two, or before you do this, you may have to use sample data. Like with the parallax, you may have to use sample data if you've already done it without a Chile telescope. Um, and we phrase it this way just to try to shame the instructors into at least trying and not relying on the sample data so much because uh, it does have an impact and data ownership is an important thing we found. Okay, so in the last two minutes or a bit, I'm gonna show you how to put this in. Let me load up lab five here. And we're going down to observe a globular cluster and there are different clusters for each season. Northern hemisphere fall, we use NGC 1261. Now I gotta admit, and the others are fine. This one, the reference star, it turned out to be a variable star. So it's, it's it, we're gonna switch to the star right next to it. It's the same brightness. I just need to update the figures. That'd be part of the update. Uh, often it works anyway, just with a little bit more scatter, but I'm a little embarrassed. Uh, my reference star is a variable star, which screws this all up sometimes. Anyway, we give them a finding chart. We do different orientations because they sometimes have a hard time with the, the flipping and rotating. But NGC 1261, what we're putting in here, and see here's our spring target, our summer target, and we're telling you to put in, I think it's 50. So it's going to repeat 50 times with one hour between each. Our libraries, they vary faster than a day. So we're doing an hourly cadence, 50 of them. It will probably take three or four days, four or five days to collect them all. Do not flag it as a TOO. And 80-second uh, exposures in the V-band. These will be calibrated, so they have to be in a band. So let me just show you how to do that in Skynet real quick, and we'll call it a day. Optical observing. Come on, Skynet. Now we're doing a demo. Here we go. Um, add a new observation. Keyword NGC 1261. Search. It's a glob. There it is. Uh, make sure we got our magic numbers of minus 12, 20, 0 0.5. And those moon numbers are fine. And we don't need any advanced features. It's clearly observable in the south. I'm going to choose our filters. And for this, we're using V-band. Most of the southern scopes have V-band. Save and continue. And we say pick all prompt telescopes in the south. There's another one called RCOP. It's now, it's cameras covered in ice. We've been screaming at them to stop and take it off <laughs> before they destroy it. Um, let's just stick with the prompt telescopes. And most of these hopefully will be back very soon. We're gonna go to generic and we're gonna put in 50 80 second exposures. 
Uh, so 1.1 hours, and you can see as I go from scope to scope how that scales. Hmm, okay. And then the only thing you got to really do is repeat this 50 times with one hour in between, just like we did repeated with the moon going around the planet in lab three. It's the same deal. Uh, it should say continue on next available telescope. That's critical. If one of these goes down, you want to go to one of the others. Save and continue. Why did you put both 50 exposures and do it 50 times? Oh, crap. Thank you very much. Totally wrong. Um, you want one exposure for 80 seconds. It's correct in the video. I just screwed it up now. And it's one exposure for 80 seconds and repeat that 50 times with one hour gaps. Otherwise, it will just run for the full hour and then move to the next one for the full hour and you'll get you know, a zillion exposures. Thank you for catching that. <laughs> so I don't confuse people who watch the video. And that's probably why I didn't have enough time. Well, I still don't have enough time. Um, the, the only account I have that has all of these here. And so I needed to make sure I had enough credits in the account. I'd have to go back and add credits, but you, you get the idea. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. And next time we'll begin with the beginning of Lab 4 Parallax. Uh, and we do both a manual activity outside, which is kind of cool. And then we'll do Parallax to Main Belt Asteroid, which we talked about observing. Parallax to Venus, so they get the AU. And then Parallax to Alpha Centauri using the AU. And the Parallax to the Main Belt Asteroid in Venus comes from the size of the Earth, which they got from Lab 2. Anyway, I'll stop now. If there are any questions, uh, I'll be here uh, for the next 12 minutes till my TAs come. Thanks, Dan. My pleasure. Thank you, Dan. Um, I had a, I actually had a couple of questions. One's kind of random. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I had a student ask me like, what do the natives think about Sierra Tolo and the observatory being there? Um, they love, they, they love the astronomers. It's not a Mauna Kea situation. Uh, I've never heard of any political problems. They love the astronomers coming down. It's a source of revenue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that I should probably somebody yeah. asked on Sunday because I threw up a big image of of a prompt and, on a presentation that I was I was doing and um to get them a, a introduction to Skynet right and um and uh, that was one just oddball question that I was like, and, oh, I, so it's a, I should probably stop the video but uh, I'll let it run um I mean, they love the astronomers coming down so much that they often try to marry off their daughters to the male astronomers who come. I have a good friend of mine. Uh, he was flying down there, and right on the plane as he's flying down for the first time uh, was uh, – he ended up dating her for years and years. And I, I have no idea if it was random or if she was planted in that seat. It didn't work out. Uh, she ended up marrying – another really good astronomer friend of mine when he was stationed in Chile. So, <laughs> and, and, and they get along great, right? But um, it was really fun at uh, AAS. Uh, the three of us got together uh, just for hanging out because we did undergrad together. And it's kind of funny how the one girlfriend had ended up the other's wife, but uh, we all got along, it's fun. But yeah, they they love and sometimes literally love the astronomers <laughs> down. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was I had a number of students, and this could have to do with the icing, right? But they were taking like Saturn images and they just came out like black. And they weren't using the darks or anything. They were using the actual image, but it was just black. It almost seemed like the dome was shut or you something send me some ids i mean sometimes that can happen maybe there was a dome failure on that telescope that particular night um 
normally it wouldn't image unless it thought it was open when it was really closed. Maybe it was a dome sensor error. And the dome was closed and it thought it was open, so it cranked out observations. I faintly remember that happening on one scope sometime in the past week or two, and it was okay. fixed the next day. Again, real world equipment, real world circumstances, I would expect 20% of images need, need to be reshot. If if that was a uh, USAC that happened on USAC, that's right. Yep, it was um, uh, Saskatchewan, uh, the prompt yeah. Saskatchewan telescopes. Yeah, and we got the second one. There are two of them, though. I think one of them has an ice problem, so it's now back down to one. We're having a lot of ice problems on some of our older cameras uh, right now, and we're going through a process of getting the camera bodies rebuilt. They they're old Apogee cameras. And so the, the bodies are being rebuilt by Finger Lakes while they're still willing to rebuild camera bodies. It, it, they're getting out of that business. So we're. Yeah. Hi, Joseph. Joseph and Dan, there's uh, a, a double, uh, AAS had some stuff on the indigenous communities in Chile. I just shot you a link. Okay. They had posted one um, that talks about the relationship between, you know, Western astronomers and indigenous communities there. In and, case it comes up. Yeah, and, and maybe I don't have the whole story, but I don't know of any problems with Tololo. There, and perhaps there are, but it's not like Mauna Kea problems. It's not like Mauna Kea, no. I, there are challenges that there are larger systemic challenges down there, but it's not Mauna Kea. <laughs> yeah. So I, I chatted the link to you. To you. Yep, I, I pulled it up. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those uh, and the students that couldn't get observations uh, or their Saturns came out dark or just non-existent. They should right? just resubmit. Resubmit. Yeah. Well, I had them resubmit, but for the sake of getting the lab in, um, mm -hmm. I kind of did a little... I don't want them using other people's oh. images, probably, but in this case, I mean, I was like, you know, if you have a buddy in the lab... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, we got to be flexible, particularly in the first lab. Uh, mm -hmm. We want everyone to do the first lab, everyone to have a good experience with the first lab. It's a learning curve, right? We don't want to smack them down before the ball even gets rolling. Or, you know, sometimes you'll have a student who uh, didn't put the stuff in in time and, and you can just say, well, you get an F. Uh, but then they're screwed for the rest of the lab. So I'm, I'm very generous and, and forgiving on the first lab. Yeah, I, I've got one who, I mean, after the first lab, uh, which was the day before Labor Day, <laughs> didn't show up uh, and came in the next lab and was like, woe is me, I'm going to drop the class. I'm like, ah, you know, come on, give it a shot. You know, you got till the end of October. Right? We we had a discussion about this at the NC Astronomers meeting. And there is this effect uh, that as schools have switched to Opus, sometimes they have a higher drop rate. At the beginning, so a lot of people take astronomy thinking, OK, I'm going to do constellations and, and stories of the sky. And then here we're hitting them with STEM activities where they're doing <laughs> science and uh, they're like, oh, this is not what I expected. Um, I took astronomy because I was trying to get out of this. I'm going to go switch into rocks for jocks. And uh, yeah. And so there is, uh, you know, you will have a certain stillborn rate there. But the one to remain uh, our education research is just showing remarkable things, as we talked about before, I think, in self-efficacy. And hopefully with the new curriculum, we're seeing hints of wonderful things with STEM attitudes. Mm -hmm. And and that's the magic combination. Uh, you know, it's, it's three things, really. It, content knowledge, of course. And that's the thing everyone's always focused on. But self-efficacy, if you can convince them, yes, I can do this. In STEM attitudes, yes, I like doing this, then you may produce new STEM majors. Was in-cam was good this year? Uh, well, it's it always was, good. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was fine, except it, tragic ending. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Stan Converse, and my good friend Dave Moffat uh, came up. Uh, Stan has taught Opus forever. He was the first institution to adopt Opus outside UNC at Wake Tech. Um, and my friend Dave, and they're all over on the MWU side right now. 
And as Stan was leaving the conference, he had, I guess, not a heart attack, but a heart something. His heart stopped. He fell on the pavement. Fortunately, Dave was out there giving him a jump. Um, when he fell on the pavement, he totally bashed his face in. And oh, so they, they pulled me out. I was doing my session on education, and they, they pulled me out since, you know, I know him. But um, he's in the hospital still recovering. They had to put four plates in his – he's in his 70s. Four plates in his face, 19 screws. He's still intubated and sedated. And just total terrible end. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, that must have happened after we left. Yeah. Yeah. If you left um, – uh, it probably happened around 3, 30, 3, 45. Yeah, that was after we looked right. At, not that long after we left, but I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Otherwise, it was a good conference, but uh, no, I I just went to the emergency room to wait for his wife, who was an hour and a half out, and had to rattle a few cages there because by the time she got there, the hospital still didn't know that he was there or where he was. And um, but Dave, Dave performed CPR, saved it, saved his life um, until the EMT people came. But it was, I mean, the fire department came. They had to hose off the parking lot. It was so bad. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, it was just terrible. So um, we're still checking on him daily. And I, I I went out to lunch with him that day. He's, you know, he's in his 70s, but he's still fun and jovial. And um, it's just tragic. He goes to Arriva with me every year, has for about a decade. So hopefully he recovers well. But it'll be slow. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. So, yeah. Did that happen during the teaching exchange or the teaching is exchange? Yeah. yeah. The exchange, the the primary topic was what we actually just talked about. Um uh some people leaving the STEM labs early or the uh the Opus Labs and dropping the Opus Labs when they realize they're gonna have to actually do science. Uh, <laughs> and so we're having that conversation. It was a good conversation, but then that you know they pulled me out for that. I know our instructors have planned to go, uh, or a lot of, well, we were planning to go and it was kind of an up in the air. Um, cause you know, coming down from Boone is like, that's a, that's a hike. And, yeah. uh, um, so I know Dan Caton went. Yeah. Caton was, was there. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think if anyone else went from, from Boone, but, uh, Caton was certainly there. Went out to lunch with him too. He's a good guy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, it's interesting hearing your comments about the classes because that's it's interesting because that's kind of what we do is we have even though it's technically listed as a lab and a lecture, there we just have one block of time, well, two, well, two blocks of time during the week where we meet. We give them the same grade for both. And it's just all the same activities. And we, we've kind of mixed up the lab and the lecture activities, except we want, we want to add some more experiential labs, which is how we got into Opus, right? Mm -hmm. So it, we're kind of in that zone of, yeah, instead of like having a three hour, a blah, blah, blah session, right? We do lecture tutorials and all, but they're not enough, right? That's why we yeah. wanted to get into Opus. In, in my mind, you're on the right track and, and, once you Good start to hear that, actually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, this is this is the revolution. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's what. Welcome happened. to the revolution. <laughs> Welcome to the revolution. <laughs> it, it, we went to the Toronto conference and we were just so pissed off. Everyone's still talking about seasons and phases and styrofoam balls on sticks. And meanwhile, <laughs> we're giving these workshops you know, down the hall that no one's attending, showing this, showing the future. And, and they're still here stuck in the past. And I, I remember like one of the last talks was given by one of my colleagues and he actually wrote the thing out and read it. He's a ballsy, he read it off his cell phone, but it was like manifesto time. And one of the comments was, well, actually working with astronomy day is hard. What do you propose we do? And it's, go to one of the fucking workshops that we held all week. <laughs> um, and yes, I'm still recording and I don't mind that I said that. Um, a revolution needs to take place. That, that got us pissed off, and um, and and so yeah, we see it as a revolution, and 
in, in this Chapel Hill meeting is not just to teach people all these new tools, because we can now do it. We can now do the things that you traditionally teach in lecture. It's not just to teach them the tools, but we're, we're going to spend like a day writing documents, discussing and writing documents that Michael Fitzgerald and uh, Saeed Salampour and others are going to coalesce into a decadal plan for introductory astronomy education, mm -hmm. carry it to the funding. We're going to invite the funding agencies. We want to tilt the playing field in our favor. You know, I'm glad not to get you back on the rant. I know your TAs are here. Um, <laughs> but yeah, my students like did not like the seasons going back and doing something that they've been taught like, you know, their entire lives um, and having such an emphasis on it. And it was a clear night. They would much rather be out using the telescopes. And, yeah. uh, um, it doesn't even scaffold. It doesn't scaffold to hardly anything, nothing in stars and maybe a little bit in exoplanets, right? Yeah. Or, or the other plants in the solar system. Phase is barely even scaffold in the solar system and in, in exoplanets. It, mm -hmm. But these concepts, they're the brightest things, the sun and the moon, closest things, historically first things figured out first. So the, they're at the beginning of our textbooks. And that's the only reason in, that I can see that they're emphasized so much in elementary, middle, and high school. It's just because it's the first thing in the college textbook. And I, I think our college te textbooks need to become background resources that we consult when needed. And we just need to do. Anyway, we just I interrupt. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah, we, we just completely dropped textbooks for, for us and just use background information. But yeah, uh, well, I'll let you let you go. I don't want to interrupt time with your TAs, your hardworking TAs. <laughs> well, you are you're on you're ahead of the curve on on the coming revolution. So good for you. Yeah, it's kind of dizzying out of here in front, though, <laughs> trying to figure out what <laughs> yeah. we should be doing. <laughs> yes, well, definitely come to the Chapel Hill meeting in May, assuming we can actually get the whole thing organized. We'd love to have your input as someone who's actually doing it. Yeah, because I got to I go I go up to the lab. In Raleigh, you know, pretty mm -hmm. regularly anyway. So yeah, just to organize that just so I can do that. All right. Thank you, sir. Have thank a great you. day. You too. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>